Flat Pennies by Robert Ward, Scene 1. Fade in. Exterior, drab apartment complex, day. Litter swirls in the parking lot of a decrepit building the color of bar olives. A small delivery truck arrives at the first unit. The driver hurries a box of groceries to the door, rings the doorbell. The curtains flutter as someone inside peeks out. Interior, Ian's apartment at the window. A disheveled man, Ian Crocker, late 30s, unshaven, wears a striped train hat. He sits alert in a wheelchair. He peeks through the curtains of a dim room as a Chopin nocturne plays softly in the background. Go ahead, leave it. We'll be out there in a minute. Ian breathes choppily, listens, waits for the driver to leave. Behind Ian, a mammoth model train layout winding through twinkling streetlights, buildings, trestles, and mountains. Ian, convinced that the truck has driven off, rolls for the door. Exterior, Ian's apartment. Ian's door unlatches. He rolls out halfway, squinting. He peers left and right, strains to lift the box up in his lap. Apartment complex, parking lot. A loud, rumbling, older, faded, big blue car sways across the driveway entrance like artillery and squeals towards Ian. Inside the big blue car. The car is driven by Matt Killebrew, late 20s, a muscular skater punk in a tight tank top. He has an Al Capone sneer and short, slick, gunmetal blue hair. Interior, Ian's apartment. Ian hightails it back inside the safety of his bunker before being noticed, inside the big blue car. Sitting next to Matt is his wife, Antoinette, said to be 30. Heavy makeup, white cotton dress, tats, raven hair, raven personality. Matt and Antoinette grapple with each other as they yell. Antoinette, who made you queen here? You did, the Lord of the Flies. Flies, another loving comment. I said lies, ass munch. Their timid son, Tyler, 10, wears styled gelled hair and a shirt with a fluorescent Gandhi. He languishes in the back seat. The car screeches up to Ian's apartment. Tyler clambers out the split second the car stops moving. Interior, Ian's apartment, at the window. Ian witnesses the fracas. A hand operates behind the curtain crack. The other grips a wheel with intent. His eyelid twitches. The screaming outside gets louder, vociferous. You'd rather live in this barrel of acid? It's less toxic than being with you. Ian struggles to reach his porch light switch while still watching the action. Great role model for Tyler, you skank. Ian fingers the switch, flipping it continually on and off. My heart can't take this anymore. I didn't know a heart pump bullshit. <sighs> Inside the big blue car. Matt, as with all primates, finally notices the blinking porch light. He stops mauling Antoinette and lets go of her. What the hell is this cripple doing? Exterior, Ian's apartment. Antoinette uses the distraction to slide out of the car. She slams the door and catches her dress in it. Matt, you can stand to be a gentleman yourself. Show some class, you donkey scrow. She yanks the dress free and marches towards the building. Don't scratch the paint, I told you. You damage everything you touch. Antoinette gives him the finger over her shoulder. I'm done with this hellhole. Inside, big blue car. Matt barks in Ian's direction. You don't want to mess with me, gimp. Matt peels away in the car. Interior, Ian's apartment at the window. Ian's eye follows Antoinette strutting to her door. She lives next to him, so the door slam is loud. There's a soft, gentle knock on Ian's door. Ian, cautious, opens it. Tyler stands there, shell-shocked. Interior, Ian's apartment, model railroad layout. Tyler gawks at the make-believe world before him. Miniature plastic people with jovial faces and lives are sprinkled throughout the shimmering layout. Is the train running today? Ian throttles a long freight train into motion. Runs every day, Tyler. For those who always remember to look both ways. Tyler enjoys the show, immersed in the display. He shuffles to Ian's side and looks sideways at Ian, who nods yes. The boy takes the controls. Ian, his reddish hair matted, places his train hat on Tyler. Tyler increases the train's speed and toots the horn. How's your mom today? Bet this train could smash a big car. Your dad didn't sound 
happy again. Tommy says Matt is just playing. He's really scary in the place. Together they watch the train. Tyler ignores the world. You guys are just playing a game? Um, you know, same one. Different names for each other? Make mommy cry. Think she enjoys that? I was strong. Didn't even get a sore arm this time. Ian and Tyler observe the train winding through the town. A knock comes from the ajar door. Ian flinches. Tyler plays. Antoinette leans in, tense, aloof, smirking. He's not pestering you, is he? Ian, bashful, finger combs his hair and adjusts his shirt as he shuts down the train, afraid to show that he's attracted to her. Not exactly Grand Central Station in here. Antoinette notices the empty whiskey bottle standing like a silo next to a barn on the layout. He's had a long day. Thanks for the rescue stroke. I owe you a new bulb by now. <laughs> Just a little beacon of hope. Come on, T. Dinner's almost boiled. Tyler loosely hugs the inn and offers to return the train hat. Why don't you wear it to me? Tyler leaves Antoinette and starts closing the door behind her. She tilts back in and softens. He has no friends. Thank you. She shuts the door as Ian fixates thoughtfully on the layouts nearby picnickers on a grass hill surrounding a pond. A moment later, a vicious hard knocking at his door startles Ian as if he is electrocuted, and then he hears the rattling of keys. He wheels toward the door like a condemned man. Just cleaning. One moment. He opens the door slowly and then recoils backwards away from it, bumping into the layout. Ian squirms as he beholds Mrs. Scott, 60s, a craggy, garish sumo with stabbing lipstick who's just tated strychnine. Her plum pantsuit jars against the gorgeous sunshine. Had another complaint about you popping fuses again. Mrs. Scott, I keep a, a low profile. Fuses, I say it. She rounds a wad of keys in her hand and works them over like a tennis ball for stress relief. Ian needs his hands. The little trains don't use much juice. The building's wiring could be old. You'd know about the uses of juice, wouldn't you, Pumpkin? The uh, supplements in my pain medications. Yeah, I'm sure it's been prescribed. Listen, about your lifestyle. Leading you where? Who should you blame? I'm fond of what I created here. You're buried in a cemetery on the sunny days. Get out and explore the real world. Fresh air's free, you know. Ian, sullen, insulted, sweeps his eyes over his layout. I'm not a shut-in, I'm just contemplating. The difference between contemplation and what you're doing is plump psychotic. I, this hobby keeps me sane, distracted. First chance I get, Disneyland here gets renovated. Renters have asked about the availability of this unit. Ian's shoulders stiffen upright, emboldened by his anxiety. Yeah, I forgot apartments next to the dumpster are in much demand today. Why don't you let your mouth overload your tail, boy? It's the wheelchair, isn't it? Would it be better if I returned from war? Mrs. Goth, wounded, freezes, and her glare turns into a skull. Your wheelchair to me ain't nothing more than a park bench. Ian's brief bravado disappears. He studies his dead legs. Mrs. Gus steps back, pities him, and reclaims the upper hand. Make a new badge for you, my little scout. Stitchin says, be prepared. Never late with Ren, but you want to toss me for some bulbs? Consume more juice than Barry Bonds. I'm quiet. Kept to myself for years. Juice is costly nowadays, Ian. This ain't Vegas. I, I don't like gambling on my future. I guess I could cut service, close some stations in less populated areas. Mrs. Gut, smug with disbelief, bends towards Ian's face. You know this ain't real, right? Mrs. Gut walks away, leaving Ian staring blankly outside. Juice is juice. Like an orange, I reckon. Cut it with a sharp knife. Later, model railroad layout, night. Ian stages a rescue scene between miniature medics 
and an injured climber on a mountain dusted in fake snow. We'll have to get Jetty here in no time. Don't blue coat on us. What's the ETA of the jumper? <sighs> Kindness will never be. Ian ruminates on the distance for a moment, lost in thought. He opens an old laptop nearby, hits a key, and there's the sound of old internet dial up. He starts typing and mumbles as he hunts some pets. Fortitude strengthens his face. Front door a moment later. He rolls to his entryway, goes halfway outside, scans the walkway and parking lot, making sure he's alone. Closes his eyes, breathes in a cigarette slowly, exhales into the moon. Model railroad layout later. Alongside his railroad, which makes the perfect table, Ian pours a whiskey shot, stabs tuna in a can, looks over his mail, opens an envelope, a lottery ticket, eyes the numbers. Shit. Middle of the night. Ian rolls towards the apartment hallway with urgency. Bathroom. Ian struggles to mount the toilet. Finally gets comfortable. Fuck it. Stools off of Interior. Antoinette's apartment. Living room. Night. Antoinette and Tyler live in a sparse apartment. Downright sad, actually. A few toys and just a beaten sofa. She lounges with her legs folded up on the sofa, reading Jack Kerouac's On the Road to herself. She strokes Tyler's sleeping head nearby. I realized these were all the snapshots of which our children would look at someday with wonder, thinking their parents had lived smooth, well-ordered lives, and got up in the morning to walk proudly on the sidewalks of life, never dreaming the ragged madness and riot of our actual lives, our actual night, the hell of it, the senseless emptiness. Antoinette gazes with moist eyes at Tyler. It's then she swings her gaze to a crooked poster tacked on her wall of a bucolic home surrounded by daffodils and white picket fence. Interior, Ian's apartment, bathroom, night. Ian is finished on the toilet and grabs the toilet paper, but the roll pops loose from the wall and unravels away from his reach. He gasps, shaking his head. Interior, Ian's apartment, model railroad layout, day. Sunshine pierces through a gap in the curtains. Ian, eyelids puffy, stages an accident scene of a toy car at a corner. A miniature plastic female pedestrian lies in the street. Ian dabs a speckle of red paint on her blouse. A fire engine is positioned nearby with little firefighters sprinkled around. Ian, a slight tremor in his hand, moves a firefighter closer to the victim. You'll be okay, ma'am. I'm taking good care of you. You're not alone. Ian's head explodes toward the curtains. He hears clanking of a chain outside his door. His arms rigid, his hands grip his wheels taut. His face is a mosaic of fear. Interior, exterior, Ian's apartment. Alex Rutledge, 17 years old, moppy hair, sluggish, wearing a basketball jersey, locks his bicycle with a thick chain. Ian, done peeking, opens the door wide as sunlight attacks his apartment. He rolls backwards, squinting, calming down. I thought you were calling first. Alex enters and gawks at the metropolis with curiosity. Ian strikes a grandiloquent posture with his arms open toward the layout. Behold, Alexandria. 